So it looks like we've got um, about 20 people here, so we'll get started. Happy Thursday, everyone, uh, and welcome to our virtual Beaver and Brews happy hour. Um, my name is Lauren, and I am the River Run Network Program Coordinator here at WMG, and I'll be your moderator for today. Um, you may have noticed that your microphones are off, uh, so we um, this is so that we'll be able to hear the speaker as well throughout the event. Uh, for any questions that you may have, we'll be using the chat feature, which is either at the bottom or the top of your screen. It's indicated by a little chat bubble, so you can click on that and post any questions that you may have throughout the event. Um, and we will have time for questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We'll have time for questions during particular points in the event. There are transitions um, that we'll make, so you all are welcome to post questions during any time, um, but we will um, I'll be relaying those questions to Mike and Trevor um, during those times that we will um, pause and ask questions. Um, but we do have some questions for you. So one of the things that we can do here in Zoom are called poll questions. Um, we'll have some of that and some Beaver trivia for you as well later on. Um, but the first question is about um, Watershed Management Group, Watershed Management Group's River Run Network. Let me pull that up. Do, 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 do. Um, so I can launch that and you all are welcome to answer. So um, the uh, so a little bit of background, the River Run Network is Watershed, manage watershed Management Group's um, collective movement of Tucson community members uh, towards conserving water and restoring our rivers. We've got a lot of opportunities for people to participate um, in our network. Normally we have creek walks and river cleanups, um, restoration workshops and the like going on. Uh, but during this time, we're hosting virtual events like this one. Um, so it looks like we've got about 14 people um, answering that question. So we can wait for a little bit more of you all to answer. Almost there. Um, so along with these, um, and the polling and show the results. So it looks like we've got quite a few, um, everyone in every different category. So welcome to the new person. Um, and of course, probably more than once on new people. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. So along with um, these virtual events, we're also hosting other events related to our steward in place effort um, through the River Run Network. And that's all about uh, what you can do in your place or in your house to impact your local creek or river. Um, I would like to encourage you all to visit our Steward in Place webpage to learn more about this. Um, and if you decide to take action, whether that's building a basin, picking up trash, or something else um, that makes your local neighborhood uh, a better place, we have a raffle going. Uh, so if you do something like that, if you participate in Steward in Place and you post it on social media, using the hashtags River Run Network, Steward in Place, and WMG. Um, you could be entered to win a River Run Network gift basket. Um, and speaking of river restoration, let me stop this. Um, I would love to tell you all about our river restoration efforts and um, our hopes of having a thriving beaver habitat in our community, um, in our river systems. So without further ado, um, We've got two speakers today, and I'll introduce Mike Foster first. So Mike is a volunteer for Friends of the San Pedro River. He's a longtime resident of Bisbee. He retired from the Sierra Vista Public Schools um, <clears throat> after 28 years, and for the last eight, he's worked as an interpretive host at the Carr House Information Center for the Coronado National Forest. He has a small business called uh, videos for our environment and has produced many natural and cultural history videos for Sonora and Arizona. And he's volunteered over 5,000 hours for Friends of the San Pedro River making videos and doing beaver surveys. And we've also got Trevor, uh, who is wearing his beaver shirt as appropriate today. Um, he is Watershed Management Group's Restoration Director. Um, he graduated from the University of Arizona in 1991 with a degree in ecology. Uh, for 10 years, he studied the impact of suburban development on rattlesnakes and eel monsters. Um, and he loves beavers <laughs> as well. So he um, has practiced riparian and upland restoration across the Sky Island region for about the 20, 25 past years and um, has developed a robust methodology for the assessment, planning, and design of restoration projects. Um, so Trevor, you want to take it away? 
Sure. Can we close that? Uh, I close that box out. I thought I did. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. And that reminds me, I need to change my bio on our website. I don't like that. Uh, but that's another story. So, uh, yeah, we're very interested in beavers here at WMG. We have a 50 year vision to see uh, the restoration of the heritage, the rich natural and cultural heritage of flowing creeks and rivers in the Tucson Basin. The flowing Santa Cruz uh, supported agriculture 4,500 years ago, the oldest agriculture in the US, irrigated agriculture. Uh, so this was a wet spot back in the day. <clears throat> Uh, there were large cienegas, large mesquite, and other uh, riparian woodlands. Uh, and it's all gone now, or a large majority of it's gone. But we think we have the uh, plan to uh, start getting that back. We have a 50-year vision. We actually have a 50-year strategic plan that you can find on our website. We are taking public comments on there through, through, through a short survey. So please uh, take a look at that, fill out that survey. Uh, we wanna make sure that, uh, that the community is behind us and that's the reason for the River Run Network. The community has to be behind this vision that we have right here, right behind us of a beautiful beaver pond at the confluence of Pantano and uh, the Tank of Verde. Uh, that's a long ways off, unfortunately. So uh, I'm gonna just talk about why beavers and why in Southern Arizona. Beavers are, you know, are widespread. Canada, the US, Mexico, all over the place. But in starting in the 1700s and in the 1800s, they really took a beating from fur trapping. And in many areas, they have made a tremendous comeback. And in fact, there are problems in some creeks and rivers around the nation and are actively relocated. Uh, however, we want to welcome the beavers here. I don't think we're going to have any issues with our beavers, and I'll tell you why later. But uh, so the San Pedro, and Mike's going to talk about that. He's a wealth of knowledge, so I won't talk much about the San Pedro at all, except to mention that it was called the Beaver River originally before it was, uh, before it was named the San Pedro. And it was probably trapped out in the early 1800s. Uh, and Mike probably has that information also. Uh, however, there is no historical archeological evidence of beavers in the Santa Cruz River watershed. And what I mean by that, there are no, no skins from beavers or skulls or bones in any collection at the U of A or ASU or anywhere else. There are no remains found in any archeological sites, which is interesting. Uh, because they are found in archaeological sites along the San Pedro. Uh, however, there's a ton of anecdotal evidence out there. A lot of people mention in their writings about beavers on the Santa Cruz River. When you go back that far in history into the 1800s, people were, were only biologists were really writing about the flora and fauna and the ecosystem around them everyday people who wrote diaries and newspaper articles didn't often write about natural history subjects. Uh, and the majority of biologists that came to the Tucson Basin back in the 1800s were here for the birds. Uh, I think the habitat was here, but nobody knows for sure whether they were ever here. They're here now, they're in the Santa Cruz watershed. And I'll talk about that in the second half of my presentation tonight. Uh, a paper was recently published in a Forest Service document on riparian uh, conservation or the conservation of riparian areas that stated that the dewatering of our landscape here in southeastern Arizona and northwestern Mexico, for years we had blamed cattle slope and climate. We all know about the huge number of cattle on the landscape, the big droughts death, destruction, loss of topsoil, and then giant wet periods that just flushed the whole system, down cut many of our creeks and rivers, dried out a lot of areas. Uh, uh, this paper that was published actually points to the earlier extirpation of beavers out of, the, out of the area as the first step in that. The beavers were holding our creeks together with their dams 
and soaking water in and making water flow more slowly through these systems which supported more riparian vegetation, which held the system together because there's roots in the grounds and banks aren't eroding. Uh, so very interesting paper that was just published. Be glad to share with anybody who's interested. Uh, and so that really is the reason we want beavers back. Even if they weren't here originally, they are here now. We want it. We have a vision of having habitat in the Tucson Basin that can support beavers. And we have a good chance that beavers could come in because there's really exciting activities in the, in the area about beavers in the Santa Cruz River watershed. So how do beavers do this? Well, it's very simple. They build a dam, it slows the water down, the water soaks in, uh, and that's it. And Sometimes they get flushed out, especially in, of course, in the arid southwest where we have the monsoon and giant storms. The beavers are very adaptable and they'll always be right back and we'll rebuild that dam. Uh, and Mike will talk about that because the San Pedro gets lots of flooding and lots of, lots of loss of dams out there, but they come back. Uh, Let me think here. So I had ecological impacts on my uh, on my uh, list of topics and hydrogeomorphic impacts. So I talked about the hydrogeomorphic impacts. So the eco ecological impacts, uh, just water flowing through the desert is such a giant ecological phenomena, boom to the ecology, the life demographics of the critters, the uh, ability of our riparian vegetation to flourish. Uh, you'll see cottonwoods along the dry Rito, and uh, but beaver habitat looks more like the upper Tanka Verde or Sienega Creek, where there are stands of miles of giant cottonwoods, willows, ashes, black walnuts, and uh, Mexican elderberries, other tons of other riparian vegetation. So that water on the ground is such a, a major force in a desert ecosystem that uh, estimates that 95% of all critters depend on surface water in the Sonoran Desert to fulfill their life requirements. So out in the western deserts by Yuma, that's a puddle of water that happens every two years, but the critters out there are, uh, are adapted to that. Here in the Tucson Basin, basically everything with four legs, everything that slithers, Everything that flies needs surface water to survive. And uh, the ribbons of green that used to flow through Tucson, Arroyo Chico, Alamo Wash, uh, Christmas Wash, there's hundreds of them, all looked much different 150 years ago than they do today. They were all ephemeral, but they were all uh, had riparian vegetation. They had they held water longer than they do today. It just didn't get flushed out of the system. And uh, uh, so just super important. And I think everybody knows that, but I just wanted to get in that. And it looks like it is time for some questions. So if anybody has any questions, we have uh, 15 minutes or so we can answer questions. Uh, or if not, we could uh, jump right in with Mike and he's got some great videos, some great information. He's done wonderful work down on San Pedro. Well, I will let you all uh, fill that chat box when you are ready, but um, while we're I waiting. I uh, want to mention one thing about the historical uh, uh, distribution. Uh, David Stevenson, a great friend of wa Watershed Management Group and a, a former board member, just two days ago sent Catlow and I, a, uh, some excerpts out of a 1953, let's see, what year is it? May of 1953 Arizona highways that actually had a beaver on the cover. And this uh, person, Willis Peterson, the author, interviewed a Howard uh, Barney Bonerman, Bonerman, uh, uh, that was a uh, trapping beaver and relocating beaver for the Arizona Game and Fish Commission, putting beavers in where they had been extirpated previously. Uh, 
And he's quoted in this article as saying, in the early territorial days, Arizona had a tremendous beaver population. Practically every stream from the San Pedro to the Colorado was populated by these industrious creatures. Altitude didn't seem to make any difference. Beavers are found in the warm lowlands as well as the cool mountains. So really the only major water course between the San Pedro and the Colorado River is the Santa Cruz River. So uh, again, it's, it's perplexing that there is no archeological or historical uh, evidence of beavers in the Santa Cruz River, but uh, as I keep mentioning and I'll talk about later, they're here now. Um, I have not seen anything in the chat feature, but before um, Mike goes on, because I know he's got some great things, um, I wanted to throw out some beaver trivia for you all um, to, to do. So let's see who gets it right. <laughs> How long approximately do adult beavers grow to be? I'll give you guys a few seconds to answer. It looks like we've got something in the chat box. We've got almost all of you answering. I'll wait a little bit longer. Mm. Cool. All right, well, most of you got it right. It is three feet. And I can share that result. So 70 people, 30 people thought, 30 percent of people thought it was five feet. That's a big beaver. I, there probably are beavers that are like that, um, that big, but uh, cool. All right. Um, I think we have um, one comment from someone in the chat box. Dale says, I think Smith had one mention at Fort Lowell. So I'm just, I'm replying to him right now, and that's, oh. that's probably G.E. Smith. Mm -hmm. So we quote him extensively in our River Run Network uh, promotional stuff. Uh, he had a great description of what the Rito uh, uh, Valley looked like in the 1800s. Uh, based on a bit of conjecture, I will have to go back and look at that, and I do want to pull that if he actually does. So thanks, Dale. Thanks. Cool. Um, and we do have one question. Um, do, ooh, I lost it. There we go. Uh, do beavers in this area ever build bank dens? Do either of you all know? Yes. They build bank dens. They do. Okay. Yes. Cool. And, well, they, yeah, they all do because the, there's not enough water to actually build a lodge in the middle mm -hmm. of the pond. So mm -hmm. they're all bank living beavers. I've only seen one lodge here um, <clears throat> along the San Pedro. There was an old gravel pit and the San Pedro, when it would flood, would fill that gravel pit up and the water was deep enough and they actually had a lodge in the middle. But other than that, every other single uh, beaver inhabitation I've seen has been a bank lodge. And an uh, interesting thing about the bank lodge is I believe that they go back as, as much as 40 feet into the uh, bank because when I walk along, they usually have air holes and uh, you have to watch that you don't step in it and break your ankle. Uh, and I've seen um, holes that appear to be breather holes for these bank lodges. Uh, can't prove it, but they were uh, 40 feet away from the river, which indicates that they may have some pretty long tunnels underground. That is very cool. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, Mike, with that, would you like to take it away about the San Pedro? Uh, sure, sure. Well, I'm glad everybody's uh, here today. I love talking about this subject. I've been uh, walking the San Pedro ever since I came to Arizona about 38 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, I'd work at the school system and I just needed to unwind at the end of the day or at the end of the week. And so every week I go and I'd spend a full day walking down along the San Pedro. And then eventually, um, I wasn't into, I liked photography, but I didn't like carrying the equipment. But then when uh, video equipment came out and Apple had their app, their editing software, I started using a video camera and all of a sudden pictures were alive because they moved and uh, they were so much more interesting. So I purchased a camera and went out and started shooting videos. And um, 
I, I filmed the San Pedro. I filmed all the seasons, the insects, the animals, floods, um, storm clouds, um, you name it. And um, I ran into a, a member of the Friends of the San Pedro and they said, you want funding? And I said, funding? For what? <laughs> and they said, uh, well, we'd like to make a video. So I made an hour long video and uh, the, the sights and sounds of the seasons of the San Pedro. And I was showing it to some people and said, well, nobody said anything. And I thought, you know, you're right. Nobody did say anything. And, you know, maybe I should start saying things. So I, I made more videos. I made one on Kawadis and uh, worked with Chris Haas, who had been studying Kawadi for quite a while. And uh, one on reptiles and one on birds. And I get local experts to come in and narrate them. And so I made a whole series of videos for the uh, Friends of the San Pedro uh, River. I have over 5,000 hours, um, probably more than that. I'm not really keeping track, but it takes so much time to make a video that I'm sure it's up there uh, 5,000 hours or more. Um, so I do have a PowerPoint uh, of, let me see if I can share my screen. I'll get to the first part of this and um, okay, can everybody see that? Oh, very good. Okay. So, um, This is uh, the video series that I've been making uh, over probably the last uh, 12, 14, year, 14 years, I think it says. And uh, I do Sonora and Arizona, a natural and cultural history. Uh, previously, a lot of natural history, now more of the cultural history. So, uh, you know, you kind of have one on the jaguar there in corridors through Mexico that the wildlife uses to come up into Arizona. Uh, all the way from Sinaloa, up, from the bottom of the state of Sinaloa, all the way up through Sonora. And I filmed on cartel lands, and they invited me in, and they were very nice. And it was scary as hell, but I uh, did film. So if you want to see what the cartel lands look like, you can see that too. Um, it's strange to be pointing a video camera in those lands, but uh, <laughs> I made sure that it was all right. Uh, anyway, so I do have a little uh, video business videos for our environment and most of what I do I just do for the hell of it because I like doing it. And then I do some uh, grant uh, work too. Uh, I currently work for the Friends of the San Pedro and uh, at the car house uh, just south of Sierra Vista about uh, five miles. So please come out and visit me when we reopen. Uh, I have time to talk. Uh, I, I only get about 30 visitors in an eight hour day. So I have plenty of time to talk about all these kinds of issues and I love talking. Uh, then I also do some work for Border Community Alliance. Uh, we've been doing a thing with the National Park Service about the uh, pilgrimage to Magdalena to Kino. And um, I've been a member of the Friends of the San Pedro since the Sprinca was started, uh, the Sprinca, the San Pedro Perry National Conservation Area in 1987. And there's my uh, my email if you ever want to write me about any questions, anything that went by too quick in the presentation. And um, I just sent this to Trevor and uh, I think it's maybe on your webpage now. And we made this for uh, school kids. I worked for the schools. I wasn't a teacher, but I was the guy that uh, showed the teachers how to make movies. And um, not many of them were making movies. So I said, I'm gonna go out and start filming stuff. What do you want a movie made out of? And I, that launched me on my career of making videos. So these are the ones that relate to the San Pedro River or are related to the San Pedro River uh, in another way. So uh, they're all educational. Uh, you don't have to worry about sending them out. In my other page that you saw previously, I do have things on how to make tequila that we don't want to share with the kids, but uh, this is a good site to share with kids, uh, homeschooling, whatever. Uh, and of course, we all know, just in case anybody has any questions, this is where the uh, San Pedro River is. There's our watershed uh, in Mexico. They call it a, a cuenca. And there's our cuenca. And as um, um, Trevor was pointing out, we have uh, uh, 
it, our watershed begins in Mexico with the uh, Chavitos, the Lamitas, the Mariquitas, the Sierra Ajo, Bavispe, uh, Mount San Jose, uh, and then it all flows across the border. But they believe most of the water that's in the Sprinca, and the Sprinca is that red line, red area, enclosed area you see uh, from Tombstone down to about um, the border. Uh, that area um, is mostly supplied by the Huachuca Mountains and not by Mexico. We figure only about 5% of the water comes in from Mexico. Of course, I can't prove that. I think Trevor might know more about that than me. Uh, so this is a list, and if anybody needs this, I can send it to you. So I, that's, it's kind of like the previous list you saw, but these are all ones that are videos that are directly related to the San Pedro River that you might want to share with friends. And, you can use them however you want. Uh, we made them uh, for uh, the school system and for adults, and we love when they get used. So they were paid for by a number of different grant sources, uh, the Walton family, uh, the Bureau of Land Management Hands on the Land, the Arizona Community Foundation, uh, ASU, the National Science Foundation, so we have a number of uh, interesting videos. And, and this one I, th I think is worth watching. Every, um, every hundred yards, I was listening to our county commissioner go on on a Sunday morning program about how we didn't need to worry about the San Pedro River because it's just fine. There's no problem with it. And I thought, well, how does he know? <laughs> it took me a good long time to hike uh, the 45 miles of the Sprinka and become acquainted with it. And I know it like the back of my hand. I, and, I, and I know he doesn't. And I see how he dresses. I know he doesn't do it. So anyways, I went out with a video camera and every 100 yards I, I paused and took a picture in June, which is when the uh, Nature Conservancy does the uh, wet dry. And so you can see exactly what the river looks like. And it's uh, worse than you'd imagine in June, even though a lot of that is still considered perennial. Uh, it looks very bad in June. I'd say uh, only about a tenth of the river is flowing in June. Of course, that changes as soon as the monsoons come. Um, so th these, are the, these are the other ones that we have, and we'll be seeing <clears throat> the bottom one there that's called beaver bite, and uh, that's where a mother beaver is uh, chasing the kid out. At about two years, they drive the kids out so they can uh, find their own mate and build their own bank lodge and uh, uh, dams. So uh, a few interesting things that I've found about uh, beaver is, and I was just talking to Trevor about this, is that um, they appear to be, uh, they appear to have moved from the San Pedro watershed over in the Santa Cruz uh, by going up into Bear Creek, and uh, which is actually the headwaters of the San Pedro. It goes, it comes from the Huachuca Mountains, and then crossing dry land and going to Campini Mesa, which is in between the two watersheds, and then down to Santa Cruz, which uh, is, you know, there's such uh, tenacious, uh, opportunistic creatures. It's really uh, great to see that spirit. Uh, a beaver was found uh, just recently this summer, 1.5 miles away from the river in Benson. So we have no doubt whatsoever that they walk across land occasionally. And it was during a flood event and uh, that beaver was relocated. Uh, some volunteers rescued it and I'll go into that a little bit more um, further on in the presentation. And so the Sprinka that, we, that I showed you is 45 miles long. And so based on the formula that Marcia Radke from the Bureau of Land Management gave me, uh, three beaver per mile maximum, uh, even if there are more than one uh, dam in a mile. So the maximum carrying capacity of the Sprinka, which goes from the border up to almost St. David would be about 135 beaver. Um, I've uh, one of the amazing, amazing things I found was uh, herbivory, which is when a beaver chews into a tree to get some something to eat, nine feet high in a tree. And could you imagine seeing a beaver up in a tree? It was at a slight angle, uh, but it was, uh, it was pretty straight. Um, now, another interesting thing I saw was uh, beaver. You, sometimes you think beaver are smart because they can build dams and do all these cool things. However, Sometimes you see things that make you think they're not as smart, like a beaver chewed into a tree and it fell on top of it. And I found the squashed beaver. I couldn't find the picture and I'm not sure you'd want to see it anyways. Um, and uh, 
the other thing I found that was really interesting is since I walked the river, like I said, every week, I used to walk it every week when I was working, there are long periods where there's no water in the river and those beavers survive. You know, we always think the beaver need to have uh, water, but it, you can go for months out there, even, you know, more than just a couple months without any water and you'll go to the bank lodges. And uh, I'm not sure exactly where the beaver go. I think they're going up into their bank lodges where it's cool. They might even go deep enough if there's water. I don't know, they might be chewing on uh, the bark of the roots. They might have a stash in there. Uh, but um, sometimes there'll be just a little pool of water just outside of it and it's filthy. And the beavers hang out there until the next floods come. Uh, so they're very tenacious. Um, I've also seen beaver directing the water channel to direct it directly at their bank lodges so that they could drag uh, the things that they've cut down, the, the, the outer branches they, and the leaves and drag those back to their uh, bank lodge. Uh, I've seen beaver eat all kinds of bizarre things. I just listed a few here, uh, spruce trees, juniper trees, tamarisk, you know, which we all hate, right? The uh, salt cedar. Uh, Bermuda grass. I never thought that would, you know, that they'd eat grass, but um, I'm sure there are a lot of other amazing things that they eat. So the beaver were released in 1999 by the Bureau of Land Management in the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And here we have a picture of the actual event. And that was just south of Hereford Road, not too far north of Palominos, which for a long time had been their stronghold. And I took this out of Marcia Radke's uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, it's free online. If you go to the Bureau of Land Management, you can find it online. And it's uh, much more of a scholarly work than I have here. Um, so I encourage you to look at it if you're interested. Uh, and so the thing I, the one slide that I really needed to use here was the uh, results of the survey. And so these are the, the years and the numbers. Uh, I got involved, I think it was 2011 to 2013. Hey, Mike, we're not yes. seeing anything on our screens. Try to share that again. Uh, oh, you're not seeing anything? Um, okay. Were you seeing any of the other uh, slides? The, just no, the way we were practicing. Okay. I, I can see it. Oh, I can't. Maybe it's... Yeah. Can I get a thumbs up from everybody? Can you all see it or a thumbs down if you can't? Okay, I'm seeing quite a few thumbs up. Oop, when I'm back to people that don't have video on. Okay, cool. Oh, now, I, like, can, now yes. I can see it. Okay, so we're just error. having technical difficulties. Thank you all. User error there. All right. Man, here I was just blabbering on without any <laughs> no, Everybody else. Nobody said it. nothing. Okay, cool. All right. So, so anyways, uh, Perfect. I started in about 2011 and I did it for three years in a row. You know, I, I would go into the BLM since I was a volunteer there and I started talking to Marcia and she's a, she's a great person and a, a very hard worker. I really like her. And, um, you know, I just said, well, you know, I can go out and do these because I found out in those previous years, they have an idea of, how, of what's out there, but they don't have the time. You know, the BLM isn't the best funded organization in the world and they don't have the time to go out the whole river. And I'm um, foolhardy enough to want to do that kind of thing. So I said, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So each year I'd walk the um, 45 miles and it took, you know, over a month to do it, you know, cause I do it on the weekends and you, know, you may not do it every, you know, two days each weekend. But anyways, it took about uh, a month or more to do it. And um, we noticed that the numbers started going down. And uh, so in two 2013, which was uh, um, one of the last years I did it, we, we went, we'd gone down from 35 to 11. And then when I started, I resumed because of uh, Henry Breen's article in two, last year in 2019, we only had three dams. And so um, on the next slide, let's see. On the next slide, uh, here is what we had, um, a total of 35 dams in 2011, which is an estimation of 105 beaver. And I don't have a, a red mark on every dam, obviously, but you know that's where they were concentrated in those areas. You notice above 82, north of Fairbank, there really weren't any beaver uh, in 2011. So then fast forwarding to 2019, 
we only had uh, three dams. And um, that's an estimated no more than 10 beaver. So the numbers have really gone down and I'll talk more about what those causes might be a little later, but I know the beaver, uh, the river can support them. Uh, so these are some of the maps we used. Um, we would do a little wet dry. So here's north of 82. We were just talking about 82, uh, north of Fairbank, getting closer to Tucson or to Benson. And you can see this, we do it in December each year. And you can see that the river is wet, but that it starts to dry out at a certain point, uh, just because there's uh, maybe less vegetation or uh, something about the geology of the area. It's sandier, uh, it's hotter, I don't know what, but we try to do that at the same time. And then the little red marks here, this is from Hereford Road down to the border, uh, the international border, and you can see the dams that we had that year. And at the very top, you see a bunch of dams. And like I said, that was a stronghold of the beaver for many years, and that's where the beaver were released. And unfortunately, there's a man up there who blames everything that's gone wrong in his life on the beaver. And I believe he's done the beaver in, unfortunately, can't prove it. But, um, you know, he said as much. He said that he was going to kill the beaver, which is, uh, you know, really sad. Um, anyway, uh, here are a few more of the maps uh, from Hereford going on up towards the San Pedro house. And here we are. Uh, going up from uh, Highway 90 at the San Pedro House up to uh, Charleston Road and just a few more. So um, one of the things that's uh, interesting to realize, we saw how I did a little wet, wet dry there in December. So when the cottonwoods change yellow, they stop using, in the fall, they stop using as much water. And then when they fall off, even less. And then the areas that were dry start to come back. So as the year goes on with the leaves falling off and the leaves in the San Pedro fall off in November, uh, going to about the end of November, early December, they're all falling off. So going into January and February, most of the whole river's uh, flowing. And um, then when spring comes, the, the river continues to flow and the leaves come back on, but it takes a while for the cottonwoods to suck the river dry again. And that's in June. So the river will go predominantly dry in June because of the action of the cottonwoods. Um, but then uh, the monsoons come and the monsoons last. And then when the monsoons quit, believe it or not, the river goes dry again and then the, the cycle starts over. But unfortunately that same um, um, uh, county commissioner had the great idea of cutting down all the cottonwoods and that's a whole other subject, but that would that would be uh, devastating for the river and a uh, whole other subject, but believe me, that would be, uh, it's a horrible idea. So uh, a lot of people wonder about the border wall. I was just down there yesterday and um, this is what it currently looks like, a Normandy style fence and in the background you can see, I lifted these off the internet, hope nobody binds. Uh, in the background you can see the cottonwoods, uh, the river channel, the gallery forest. And this is exactly at the river. That's how it looks now. They're just starting, they're replacing that fence that you see in the background, which is a 15 foot high with five feet underground with a 30 foot high uh, fence. And they've just started that work. And you see the cottonwoods are marked for to be cut down there. So I'll, we'll see what happens there. I can't imagine uh, what they're gonna make across the river because uh, the floods that come through there would surely knock down most um, fences. So. Uh, we'll see what, what they end up constructing there. Uh, and there is the uh, 30, I, I was just out at Oregon Pipe uh, Monument where they are actually making a 30 foot uh, high wall and that's what it looks like. So um, the beaver survey, I, like I said, I did it from 2011 to 2013 and then again in 2019. And I plan to do it again this coming year. And here's a friend that I do it with. Um, it's always good to go out. It's, it's real important to go out with a friend uh, because things can happen to you out there. It's pretty dense, pretty dense. Um, we walk through the river quite a bit of the time. Um, so one of the problems with beaver that um, people are going to complain about if you try to introduce beaver somewhere is that they topple trees. And um, some of them are so big that they can't gnaw uh, through them. Um, they just girdle them and Believe it or not, I always heard that the uh, 
uh, cambium layer uh, was the life layer of the tree and that the tree would die if you girdled it. But a lot of these trees will keep living a couple years beyond when the um, a cambium layer is girdled off. I guess uh, osmosis, what's it called? The, the, you know, the, the wicking process through the trunk continues to provide moisture to the uh, cambium layer above. And here's a tree that was just a uh, xylosma. Uh, here's a tree that was just about to be gnawed down. And so what a number of people did on the San Pedro was they would put uh, fences around their favorite trees. And uh, that's always an option if you do uh, start to reintroduce beaver in the Tucson area and there are certain trees, um, you could do that. You know, however beaver needs something to eat. So, you know, that's a bridge you'll have to cross. Uh, so when we're out looking for sign on beaver, now uh, here's an interesting thing. Uh, if anybody wants to try to respond, you're welcome to, but can anybody see beaver sign in this picture? There are two distinct signs. They're not real obvious. Someone says tracks. There could be yes. tracks in there. Yes, there are tracks. So their front feet aren't, aren't webbed like the back ones are. They might have a little webbing, but you can see the claws down there. And the beaver mm -hmm. came up and it gnawed. So if you look on the trunk, you can see an area. If you look closely, one area is a little lighter colored and you can see teeth mark in there. And so when we're doing the survey, we go around and we're looking for all kinds of little signs like that. There are slides where the beaver will go up and down out of the water, and that's another uh, sign we look for. Uh, here's a better example of them chewing on a trunk. And then we look for these little twigs that have been chewed off. And so, um, one of the things that took me a while to understand is that they're not eating wood, that they're chewing down trees so they can get to the outer branches, which are more tender. And then they chew off the outer branches and then they chew the bark off that cambium, that green cambium layer off, but they do not eat the wood. And then they might eat the thin, tiny branches and the buds and the leaves, but they don't eat the woody part. They knock down the trees so they can get at those other parts. Uh, here's another uh, evidence. So you're looking for all kinds of signs uh, because when you start to see those signs, then you need to start looking very closely for bank lodges and then you need to start looking for dams. You really have to pay attention when you start seeing the signs. And here's just a little twig and if you look closely, you can see a little teeth mark in there. And here is a bank lodge. Uh, this one doesn't look like it's been used. And so if you look at it, it kind of makes sense. Those leaves there right at the base of the bank lodge don't look like they've been disturbed. Uh, so that's probably been abandoned. Uh, and I took that picture recently and there haven't been many beaver around. But that's what they do. A lot of times the bank lodges are right at the level of the water and they'll go up into the bank and uh, you know, be safe back there. I've heard that they like to build them below the surface of the water so that nothing can get in. But in reality, a lot of times I'll see them right at the water's level. And you know, the water level fluctuates. So sometimes the water will be over it and sometimes it won't. Um, and then here's some fun pictures of dams. This is uh, this year. This dam is always in the same place. Um, these are one of the three that I saw this year. And just about every year I see this one dam here. It's a small little dam. And coincidentally, there happens to be a USGS well right there. And the, uh, I ran into the guy one day and he said that I was checking out the groundwater level and it went up a foot and I thought something was wrong. And then I went down to the river and I saw there was a, um, a dam on the river. And so the dam had actually brought the uh, groundwater level up by a foot. Uh, here's another pretty dam, uh, one from this year. And as you can see, they're not always all that tidy. Believe it or not, uh, they'll actually start some of their dams by rolling rocks and pushing up like a bulldozer to push up um, a gravel and sand and place rocks, almost like uh, making the foundation for a house. And then they'll pla place the uh, debris uh, on top. And there's another good example. Uh, these ones actually turned out to be videos, so you'll get to see a little bit of motion. This is one of the larger dams I saw north of Highway 92.
rather big uh, sticks in that one. Here's another one. And this one was maybe five feet high. So this is one of the higher ones on the river. Early May, beginning of May. There's a smaller one, but with a lot of water. And here's a wide one. This one is, uh, there's been a dam here for years and years and years. They like, they seem to like to go to the same place all the time. Uh, uh, you know, when they become populated, when their numbers go up, they'll choose a whole variety of locations. But when their numbers go down, I found that they generally like to stay in certain areas. And those areas are where streams come in, little tributaries come in to the main river and pile up gravel. So they already have something to work with. There's, also, there's already an alluvial, uh, natural alluvial uh, dam formed there by the tributary coming in and then they'll take advantage of that. So that's where they seem to like to build dams. That's cool. Um, might we do... Oh. I'm sorry. The video too. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you that I wanted to okay. throw in here. Um, how long do you think does it take a beaver to make a dam like the ones that you've been showing? Um, and how many do you think they built? Well, uh, the one that was five feet tall, I think they labored on that all summer. Wow. And so they, they, um, they're continually adding to it. You know, I've heard, I don't know if this is true, but when they hear the sound of rushing water, they like to go and plug that up. <laughs> Maybe that's true, but, um, you know, I once saw this uh, little video of beaver that they put in a kiddie's uh, pool, you know, like a one foot high uh, children's, play pond and they put some sticks in there and all day long the beaver went around moving the sticks from one side to the other side. So you know the whole expression uh, busy as a beaver, uh, it's the same thing with their dams. They're continually building them. But the interesting thing about the dams on the San Pedro is that each year we have big enough flood events every single year uh, that I've experienced. We have big enough flood events to come through and wipe out the dams you'll get some pretty rip-roaring uh, uh, floods coming through there. As a matter of fact, I happened to be there one year when a flood was coming through and I, I actually filmed the dams uh, being torn apart. Uh, so yeah, they're continually working on them. They'll start out small and, you know, with any luck, they'll get to be big and uh, do one, that wonderful um, uh, ecological service that they do. Yeah, looks like we've got um, another question. Can you talk about what evidence exists for beaver modification on the San Pedro improving flow, improving flow persistence? Uh, clearly a dam can locally increase moisture in the, ooh, sorry, uh, in the adjacent soil or the river aquifer, but what about more uh, systemic effects? If you can. Well, um, <clears throat> so here, the BLM came and uh, we were, they were giving us a report and one of the interesting things that I saw that really stood out in my mind is they took pictures from when the Sprinka was established and then um, more recently. And there was a railroad tie that was stuck in straight in uh, the soil and it was an eight foot high railroad tie, uh, metal, in not tie, but the um, metal rail. And um, what was it, 20, 20 or more years later, 30 years later, 20 years after the reintroduction of the beaver, the, there was only two feet left standing out. So, uh, and, and I noticed this, and I'll talk about this more as we go on, but I notice that in the flood events, that in the upper stretches, the more healthy stretches of the San Pedro, there isn't gravel coming through the way there is down in the lower stretches. And this vegetation filters out uh, the silt and the sand and piles it up. And then a lot of organic material gets mixed into that. And that, uh, that, that area stays moisture, more moist as somebody was pointing out. And then that provides for the plants and that apply, uh, provides for the insects and then the birds and the mammals. And uh, so I've seen, uh, well, the first thing they did when they um, set up the sprinkler was they took the cattle off and the area was severely uh, eroded and bare. And we have pictures before, 
before the cattle were taken off and then after. And the vegetation really came back. But then with the beaver here and, and the, their effects uh, creating, as, as that water spreads out further, um, then you get vegetation further and further from the river. And they may take a cottonwood tree that's right on the bank, but then they use it to build a dam, which then causes the water level to go up to reach more plants further away. So yeah, they will, um, you know, and that was a big issue when we started with the San Pedro is that people were saying, oh, they're gonna cut down trees. And I, and I thought about that for a long time. And as I uh, went out and walked along the San Pedro and looked at it, I see the trees that they were cutting down, but it didn't look all, I mean, you know, nobody likes to see a tree cut down but the vegetation around it was doing well. And I didn't feel like they were causing any kind of devastating ecological uh, problems. I thought they were actually improving the ecology. And, uh, you know, there's another subject we go into, which is much longer about, you know, in a, in a really healthy um, uh, river system, are there cottonwoods? And I'm sure there's some debatable um, uh, points on that. But uh, some of the early images of Cienegas uh, were without cottonwoods, were without cottonwoods. And uh, so, you know, some people say in the healing process that the cottonwoods are like scabs on the river and they uh, provide the organic material, which we'll see later. I have great examples of this later in the PowerPoint presentation. They will um, help accumulate all this organic material, slow down the silt, built it up along with the beaver and really improve the ecology of the river. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there are a lot of other things, you know, like the Wachuca water umbel you know, needs a certain kind of uh, depth of water. And I'll show you pictures of that later in this pre power presentation and fish, you know, the Gila top minnow and the long thin dace. And originally there were, I think, 13 different species of fish in the San Pedro River. And, now we're just down to the last two that I mentioned and some exotic ones. Um, but, you know, as far as uh, quantitative studies, I'm sure there are some out there. Uh, I can't really cite any right now, but just qualitatively for me being out there and enjoying the river, I, I feel that they certainly have been a, a benefit to the river. Um, and I just like having their presence. Okay, thank you. So, um, that's a fairly good dam. Now, I love this one. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Uh, that is uh, duckweed on the surface there, and it just really sets off the dam. So, and, you know, there again is a good example of, uh, you know, duckweed would not uh, grow in flowing water, so you have a different kind of vegetation. Uh, appearing behind the dam. And there's another example, and, and notice in this one how well the dam is holding the water because it's dry on the other side of the dam. That's amazing, uh, um, water retention there. Uh, and you know, uh, that's another thing, you know, it's like if you think about a river that's been eroded and how quickly the water moves off of the land, and then you build beaver dams, you're holding that water there and you're keeping it in your environment longer. And uh, it's, it's, it's just a very beneficial thing. Water is life in the desert. Second dam north of Ramsey Canyon, Canyon Wash, November 5th. So I have tons of footage of dams and you know when I saw them and a little bit of information about them. Now here's one when it starts to go dry. As you can see, the water's starting to go down in the summer, and, and this will happen, you know. And then, like I said, the beaver will take up in their bank lodges where it's cool, and, you know, they're out of the summer sun, and they just estivate. Instead of hibernate, they estivate. And they don't hibernate on the San Pedro, from what I can tell. Uh, they, they've been active any month that I go out. But in the summer, they're not, they're not active. You know, when that water is gone, they're bank, back up in the bank lodges. And uh, this is fascinating. So I was just telling you about that. Uh, this is what happens when the water dries up and the beaver go back up in their bank lodges. And that was a fairly high dam. 
Uh, one of the things that we do when we are out is we um, re report back on illegal things. This is a tree stand, uh, which is legal for only a few days. Uh, they, and, and this one had been up for quite a long time. So we report that back to Marcia. <clears throat> Marcia told me that she has found a beaver trap, a live beaver trap on the river. And unfortunately, um, the BLM doesn't like Marcia speaking. And, you know, I hate to get into politics of this, but they uh, have prevented her from speaking, which is maybe one of the reasons she's not talking here. And I spoke to another group not long ago and, and they didn't want her speaking. There's some kind of political environment, which I don't really want to try to guess about, but it's very unfortunate they don't want her to do it. Uh, but I'm glad to go out and do it. And I feel the same way about the river and the beaver that uh, Marcia does. So I, I hope I'm doing a good job of representing uh, how she feels about it. Uh, and here is a beaver video that I'm going to show you. And I was telling you that um, you all maybe have read that the kits are uh, persuaded to leave the, uh, the, uh, the dens uh, when they get to be about two years old. And then they find a mate when they're three years old. But this is a good video showing you an actual mother beaver uh, chasing out or starting to chase out a kit. So let's take a, let's watch this. I have been monitoring this beaver pond on the San Pedro River about 10 miles north of the Mexican border for most of the month of November in 2012. The river is backed up for several hundred yards behind this dam. Last year, the dam reached almost five feet high. Five feet high is about the highest I have ever seen dams get on the San Pedro River. The beaver usually begin rebuilding their dams in October after the summer monsoon floods are through for the year. On this bank, I filmed one large beaver eating Bermuda grass. I had never seen a beaver eat Bermuda grass before. Exotic Bermuda grass got into the river system and now it grows on many of the banks where there is enough moisture. In this close-up scene, you can see more clearly that the beaver is eating the grass. I was lucky enough to come across these beaver about one hour before dusk and record some clear images. Here we see scenes of a beaver climbing out of the water to gnaw on a gooding willow trunk. The three beaver I have witnessed in this pond are in the process of gnawing down about 15 different trees in the area. In the following scenes, if you listen especially closely, you can perhaps hear the sound of one of the beavers mewing. Of the three beaver we see here, I suspect the largest one is the male, and I suspect the middle-sized one is the mother. As we can see, she doesn't seem to especially like sharing the log she is gnawing on with the younger beaver, but I suspect is her offspring. I have heard that the parents will begin to chase off the younger beaver as they grow older. I have never seen this before, but this may be what is happening here.
It looks as if she is actually biting the tail of the younger one. I've seen some wounds on some beaver tails before, and those wounds may be a result of this kind of biting. Most recently, the beaver have been waiting till after dusk to come out. One will come out, test the waters, and slap its tail, and then the rest will eventually come out. So th that's it. Um, usually what I would do, you know, when you think about it, if you're willing to spend the time, beaver are not that difficult to see because if you find the dam and you find the bank lodges, and you go out there about dusk, maybe an hour before dusk and wait, usually you'll see like the first scene, you'll see a V shape of a creature swimming through the water. And that's how, what the beaver look like. And they usually come out just before um, the sunset and they'll swim around and then it might smack its tail maybe to notify the other beaver that the coast is clear or maybe there's a different smack for when it detects that I'm there and it doesn't want another other beaver to come out. But one will come out like a sentry and it'll go out and travel around and check things out. And then gradually the other beaver will come out. But every once in a while you'll get to see them in the middle of the day. And uh, I've been uh, places in the north, uh, in Colorado and Michigan, uh, Montana, where you'll see beaver that are out in the middle of the day. And this was right here on the San Pedro. And this was near the end of the day. Uh, but um, then again, if, if you get there and you spend the night out, like I've spent a night out in a tent, and in the morning you get out just as the first light's coming up, you can see the beaver swimming and sometimes they'll stay out as late as nine in the morning. Oops. So um, you all probably know this, uh, perennial river is past and present. This is what it used to be like, and this is what it currently is like, and you can see the San Pedro there. And so we do have a little perennial stretch there, supposedly, uh, although that's debatable. And uh, this is a closer look at the San Pedro. And supposedly that's perennial. But if you look at my video of every 100 yards, you'll see that in, in June, I'd say only 10% uh, of that is actually flowing. And I don't know how that qualifies as perennial. I don't know who made this. But uh, the best way to evaluate the San Pedro is to look at the Charleston Dam. If you go to the USGS and you type in Arizona stream flows, you'll find their site. And they've been uh, going for a hundred years and they've been taking measurements and you can see what the flow has been like over that period of time. You can see the gradual decline through time uh, and they have some other good graphs there. And if you ever wanna find out what's going on with the river, especially in the monsoons, if you wanna see a good flood, you can uh, go down and check it out. I use that for rafting. I've rafted on the San Pedro over a hundred times and I, I use their site. They have some really nice charts that show uh, the surge coming in and then the exponential or, um, uh, bleed off of the uh, um, flows. And this is a Wachuca water umble, uh, Fort Wachuca is practicing great water conservation because if they're responsible for the extinction of a species under the Endangered Species Act, they could be shut down when they're uh, doing the base closures. So uh, they actually are growing Wachuca water umble and reintroducing it to the uh, um, San Pedro and some of the tributaries. Uh, it's, it, when, when I first read about it, there were only like 12 known populations in the world. Um, I don't know how it's doing this year, but that's a picture of it. You don't see many pictures of it. It looks a little bit like the equicetum or the horsetail grass. And strangely enough, when I uh, was filming this, there was a uh, small uh, herd of javelina that came through and the javelina were, were, were ripping it all up. Um, 
So Speaking of, uh, sorry, okay. Mike. Um, we had a question from Trevor. I was waiting for him to, to come back before I, I asked you so that you could answer for him. Uh, do you see uh, a lot of bullfrogs in the beaver ponds or any non-native fish? I know you mentioned non-native fish a little earlier, but have you seen yeah, any the, bullfrogs while you're out there? Oh uh, Yeah, both. Uh, there are bullfrogs. There are carp. Um, there's, uh, I found a bass in there. Um, yeah, mostly carp, I would think. Um, as far as oh, mosquito fish, uh, there's got to be one or two others. But yeah, yeah, mostly. And those carp can be pretty big. And I understand there was a, a pike minnow, I think it was what it was called, that used to be in the San Pedro that was up to six feet long before we destroyed the San Pedro the way we have. Uh, it'd be nice if we could restore the river so that we could have creatures like that in the river again. But like I said, I think there were 13 species of fish uh, before um, before we got here, and now there are only the two that I know of: the long fin dace and the Gila top minnow. Uh, but yeah, bullfrogs. Unfortunately, you'll find uh, the woodhouse toads. You can hear them at night now, and then later on, the coaches' uh, toads will be out. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen the leopard frogs, but they may be there. So uh, what this scene is, is this is um, a log jam. So uh, there have been some fires and then the uh, cottonwoods, the Fremont cottonwood will fall down eventually. They call them widow makers because they're notorious for crashing to the ground. And uh, uh, then there's all this debris in the river course. And when those big floods come in out of Mexico during the monsoon, they take all the organic material and they start to uh, push it forward, but then it creates these dams, as we see here. And it, it may look unfortunate that there's so much trash in it, but that kind of keeps more of the trash from going into other parts of the river. But all that organic material really slows down the water. And like I say, when, when I get in the water, uh, you don't feel the gravel like you do in the lower parts of the San Pedro because the organic material is absorbing it. And it takes, um, like if the, if the water crosses at the Palominos gauge, in a typical monsoon, it'll take it eight hours to get up to Highway 90, which is about 10 miles away. So the river moves pretty slow, it and it all depends on the size of the flood. And then some are completely dampened off, and they may come across from Palominos up to Hereford and then dampen off before they even get up to Highway 90. They may not even reach there, some of the first uh, floods. Uh, here's another picture of it. Um, this is at Hunter Wash. And there's another unfortunate picture, but uh, it'd be a great place for somebody to do a cleanup because uh, most of the debris is, uh, is there. And, uh, you know, I, I love Mexico. I spend the winter in Mexico, but unfortunately, a lot of this uh, stuff does come down from Mexico, you know, so they could figure out a way with the wall of straining, <laughs> straining the river. Um, so there is some, there are some recharge projects going on. Um, the one I know is this one just um, in that area that I've been concentrating on where I showed you the picture of the beaver. And you know, thank goodness they're doing this. And I, I don't see this fill up very much, but this was the Metzger property just uh, north of Palominos. And I actually took a little video of it during one of the flood events. There are even some ducks on it out there. But that helps the water recharge into, uh, you know, the shallow uh, basin there before the river. And down below you can see the uh, cottonwood trees, the gallery forest, and behind it the Mule Mountains where Bisbee is. Uh, and here are some of the other uh, recharge uh, projects. Down at the bottom you see the Palominos one that we were just looking at, the Palominos flood control project. So some things are being done in the environmental um, uh, operations Park is, um, you know, it was supposed to go down into a lower aquifer, but it hit some kind of layer and uh, it's coming out into a couple of the tributaries there and those tributaries now are running. Uh, so those, those run all year long. Uh, I'm trying to think, there's one called the Escapule Wash, the other one is Murray Springs, uh, Curry Draw. Those uh, run most of the year, and now they have cotton, uh, cotton. Uh, I'm sorry, um, cattail, and bulrushes, and 
uh, they do uh, add to the flow of the river. So as you get north of there, the river seems to hold up a little bit better. Uh, so re remember how I was saying earlier when you get in the water like I, I raft in it and a lot of times they'll either fall out of the raft or jump out of the raft and you can feel that there isn't much um, a gravel until you get down into bigger flood events um, or not necessarily bigger flood events but yeah in, in flood bigger flood events you can feel that it's almost like a mudslide it's just full of gravel and you get out and you're your um, your shorts are just full of gravel and it's a total mess. But when you fall out of the raft up further on the river where you have all that organic vegetation, you don't have that. I never get that kind of stuff in there. I might get twigs, you know, mixed in my clothing. But uh, and so I, I wanted to show you all something that I think is fun and a minute of relaxation of uh, actually rafting down the San Pedro River in an inflatable kayak. It looks easy, but it's not. <laughs> That's one of the uh, easy stretches there. Uh, the straightaways, uh, I go from Charleston Road north towards Fairbank. That's my favorite stretch because there aren't that many bends. Unfortunately, there are a lot of strainers where a cottonwood tree has fallen down across the river and it could suck you underneath, which would be uh, horrible. Uh, but uh, when you get to the long straight stretches from Charleston Road up to Fairbank, you get some really relaxing stretches and there's no better way to watch the river. You can just lay uh, flat in the kayak and watch in the tree branches to see whatever birds are up there and paddle around in the river and it's totally undignified and you come back totally muddy and looking horrible, but it's, uh, you, you, have the, you have the greatest day of your life. So um, we had a rescue of the beaver. Just, uh, I was saying that one was found in a junkyard in uh, Benson, a mile and a half away from the river. And my friend took some pictures as uh, some local citizens from the Greyhawk Ranch just came out and uh, captured the beaver and brought it to the river. And here's that beaver. You can see its webbed rear feet. And there he is uh, when they let him go, uh, coming back up. And they usually find a place where they come up and go down frequently and they call those beaver slides. So if he continued to go up and down that same spot, that would be a beaver slide. Uh, there he is taken off in the water. And so we we're talking about possible uh, causes of the decline. So uh, I found a predation by mountain lions where mountain lions have left just a sack of intestines, uh, disease, uh, you know, the, the water can be dirty because there are cattle down there, even though they were supposed to be moved. The ranchers love to let them go down there. And, you know, when you have that uh, cattle flop in the water, I'm sure that's not that good. And other things washing down from Sierra Vista. And not enough water for a long enough time would be bad. The polluted water, as we said, hunting and trapping, as we mentioned. And uh, migrating on floods, I don't, uh, I think that some beaver are, are opportunistic and do that, but I don't think that. That's just expanding populations, thinning out. It's a normal thing and then normal cycles. And I'm drawing this in because I realize we're close to the ending of this thing. And um, solutions, I think they should introduce more beaver. Uh, I know the river can support it. Uh, they did well for the first um, 15 years or 13 years. They did very well. And I think that it's some, unf it's some, unfor some unfortunate, unfortunate thing. And, you know, all things have cycles. Uh, we could introduce more beaver. I believe the beaver will come back. We should place game cameras in some locations to make sure people aren't doing things to the beaver. Um, you know, we, we can do these surveys and do the wet dry and uh, photograph the dams. Uh, the Arizona Game and Fish just recently uh, was given responsibility for the hunting and uh, fishing on the San Pedro and they've allowed trapping of beaver. What a great idea. They reintroduced the beaver and now they're allowing trapping of the beaver when their number is the lowest. Can you, can you understand that? This makes absolutely no sense to me. 
So I think it'd be nice to write the Arizona Game and Fish and say, you know, what the heck are you guys thinking on the Sprinka? You know, um, don't don't allow that because if somebody feels that they can go out and trap it, they feel they can do whatever they want to the beaver. Um, and then we could do the sur surveys. I do it in December. I uh, can continue to do that. Uh, and just securing the overall health of the river really helps. And these are the things, um, do you want me to kind of sum it up here real quick? Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Okay, so anyways, um, if you want to know more, I can send you these things. Uh, I do take people out. Uh, I'm 65 and my feet hurt like heck when I get home at the end of the day after doing a survey. So I'm really trying to get people to involved here. Um, if you want to come down and participate next winter, let me know. And I can train. I trained a group from Cochise College and I want them to walk through the river because, you know, people get up on the shore and they're taking the easy way out and they're not really looking. So I like them to walk through the river if they can. And they had a blast. Uh, I ended up with these uh, four um, uh, students and they were having the time of their life. I mean, it is fun there. The river is a lot of fun to wade through. It's never that deep. And uh, my closing statement is please don't assume that beaver are not sustainable on the San Pedro River. I don't believe that at all. Uh, we should we should continue with our efforts, and I'm, I applaud your efforts to get them established in the Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz, where I think they would do well, and in, in other places. So uh, I'm really glad for for your efforts. Uh, and with that, I'll close and uh, do whatever is next, whether it's questions or whatever. Yeah, I think. Um, I think um, here in my echo. Um, if anyone has questions for Mike, you're welcome to throw them in the chat. Um, and I think um, Trevor, you can you can get started as well. So no outstanding questions for uh, Mike. No, yet. Let me. And I can stop at any time so we can answer any questions you have for Mike or myself. Yeah. So I wanted to just briefly talk. I actually gave myself 30 minutes and it might not work, but uh, beavers in the Santa Cruz River watershed. So as I, as I mentioned in my opening, there is no historical or archeological evidence of beavers in the Santa Cruz River shed. I just went to my Hofmeister. Hofmeister was a mammologist and is the uh, goat, his book, Mammals of Arizona, is the go-to book on everything mammalian in Arizona. And he actually excludes the Santa Cruz River from ever having beavers, which is interesting. But again, he's looking at the, at the scientific evidence for it. And as uh, Dale mentioned, I just went also, when Mike was talking, went to, uh, Oh geez, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's irrigation, groundwater and irrigation in the Rito uh, Valley, published in 1910 by G.E. Smith. And he has, he imagines what the Rito River looked like in the mid 1800s. And yes, indeed, he does specifically mention a beaver dam on the Rito River. Uh, I could actually believe that because the confluence of the Pantano and the Tanka Verde, which is the beginning of the Rito, was once a giant Sienega, a giant wetland that uh, was drained and turned into pasture land when Fort Lowell moved from downtown Tucson out to Fort Lowell uh, area and Craycroft area there, Fort Lowell Park. Uh, so I definitely believe that it could have been some of the people I've talked to, biologists that have been in the region for many, many years, thinks that yes, indeed, the, the, the beavers were probably in low densities because uh, the Santa Cruz River just didn't flow like the San Pedro flowed. It was still partially an ephemeral system and due to geology and uh, as it entered some of the broader uh, valleys from say Tubac up to the Santa Beer district of the Tono Odom Nation, uh, big wide valley, deep alluvium, water diving underground, which it does 
still today, today with the affluent coming out of the Nogales wastewater treatment plant. And then it flowed for a while through downtown Tucson, but then it enters the Marana area and again into a very wide valley with a very deep alluvium, no directly adjacent mountains like the Tucson mountains that forced uh, uh, groundwater to the surface at the base of a mountain. Uh, so yeah, again, we just don't know, but I really like to think that maybe in the 1700s there were beavers and they were just the first ones to get knocked out as uh, settlers came west. Uh, but I did figure out how to share my map about the very exciting return of beavers to the Santa Cruz River Shed. So I'm gonna try to share this again. Lauren, get on top of me if it doesn't work. There it goes. Did that work? It's, yep, I can see it. Okay. Let's see, let me get, can I get a thumbs up? Yep, we got thumbs up. Nice. Well, I'll have to look over on my other Great. monitor here so I won't be looking right at you. But uh, here's a map of the border area. You can see Sierra Vista on the east and Nogales and Rio Rico on the west. In 20 or 2008, I was working for Sky Island Alliance and we were on a mission to eradicate bullfrogs from the Huachuca Mountains, the Canelo Hills, the Patagonia Mountains, and the San Rafael Valley. This is the San Rafael Valley right here. Huachuca Mountains over here to the east, Patagonia Mountains to the west, and the Canelo Hills on the north. Uh, this is the head, the San Rafael Valley is the headwaters of the Santa Cruz River. This is Meadow Valley right here, which is the very top of the watershed. And it flows down. This is the town of Santa Cruz down in Sonora, the town of uh, San Lazaro right here. And then it, like three or four other little towns as it comes back north. Basically, the Santa Cruz River flows all the way from about, I don't know, 10 miles north of the border or so. Flows all the way to San Lazaro until it takes a little, till the river starts going north again. And then Nogales has a giant straw. And I mean giant. It's like a, I don't know, a four or five foot pipe to take Santa Cruz River water over this divide right it's well no over these mountains right here and i'm forgetting the most most picos mountains or actually comes up and then goes over right here into nogales and that's one of the major uh, supplies for water in nogales along with the rio uh I'm forgetting the name of the rio magdalena that starts just a little bit south of nogales but anyway we were out here searching this whole area for bullfrogs we spent four years out here every other weekend taking volunteers out, camping, drinking lots of beer, searching for bullfrogs by day, killing bullfrogs by night, uh, because you can walk right up on them with a, uh, with a headlamp on, and they're easy to capture and, and exterminate. Anyway, right, this 2010 right here is the road, the Montezuma Pass Road, which goes right here. And if, it, if nobody's ever taken this road trip, it is an epic road trip. Sierra Vista over Montezuma Pass through, and here's Campini Mesa right here, is Campini Mesa that Mike uh, mentioned earlier. And then the road goes through the San Rafael Valley, one of the most picturesque, beautiful places in Southeastern Arizona, then down into the Patagonia Mountains, comes out in Patagonia, uh, then you can come back via Sonoida or you can go down to Nogales and, and head north on I-19. But we were out here uh, and right at the bridge crossing of the, of the road, it's a dirt road but a well-maintained road, uh, we just stopped to check if there were bullfrogs in the watered area. This is, so Bear Spring is at the very top of the Huachucas and it feeds Bear Creek which flows all the way down here to Los Fresnos which is a natural preserve that is, uh, I think Nature Conservancy and Natrialia share management responsibilities. TNC may be out of it, maybe Dale can, can inform that. But as Mike mentioned, this is the very top of, it's interesting, the Huachucas have a piece of the very top of the 
San Pedro River watershed. Well, the entire eastern face of the Huachuca, of course, drains into the San Pedro. But uh, some of it drains to the Santa Cruz, but then some of it drains right through here, Bear Creek. Oh, right here, Bear Creek. Oh, it comes down to Los Fresnos and then follows it. And here's the San Pedro right here, of course. So we were out and the next year, and I have video and I couldn't get it to play for you all, but we'll share it with everybody. Uh, so we had seen the beavers there. And then I was down on the private property. This is the Lone Mountain Ranch, a well-protected ranch down here. Beautiful, beautiful area. Uh, have, has flows through it, as I mentioned. Uh, on average, it's about three feet wide and one feet deep. deep. But as I was hiking it one day looking for, for bullfrog sign or plops, uh, I saw a bunch of gnawed uh, saplings of cottonwoods. And so I knew there was a beaver out there, it was obvious. And so I stuck around the rest of the day in that area and finally found them and got them on video. It was very exciting. So as I started to talk to people about these beavers we had seen in 2010 and 2011, uh, the folks who managed down here at Los Fresnos, the biologists, informed me that they had had a beaver for a long time living in this, there's a giant house pond right here, a ranch house pond from the old, uh, when it was an old ranch, now it's a protected area. Uh, and so, you know, I thought, why, you know, so we're in the San Pedro here, up here, they put the, they reintroduced the beavers over here by Sierra Vista, but just, standing here you just walk up out of there on the Campini Mesa and you can see over into the Santa Cruz River watershed. It is just a big flat mesa cut by some very big drainages. This is basically the area where all this stuff is flowing towards uh, the Santa Cruz and all this is flowing towards the San Pedro. Uh, so in 2012, uh, still at Sky Island Alliance, my last year at Sky Island Alliance, the previous year I had written and received along with uh, uh, avian ecologist at the U of A, Aaron Flesh, a Neotropical Migratory Bird Treaty Act grant for $300,000 to fence off 20 miles of uh, the, the Santa Cruz River in Mexico from San, the town of Santa Cruz through San Lazaro, working with the local Aito ranchers and highly successful. We have now, after a second round, basically a fence the entire Santa Cruz where it flows from this Ejito through this Ejito to where it dries up over here where, where Nogales is pumping all the water out of it. Uh, we arrived to talk to our, our uh, the Sonoran Institute, introduced us to all the folks in this area because they had worked in the uh, early 2000s, late 1990s and early 2000s down here with the ranchers. And uh, they were our hosts and brought us down here and introduced us to all the ranchers they had worked for and we explained it. But what they were really excited about was they wanted to tell us that they had a beaver on the river. And so we all load up in the truck, they got a big cooler of beer, we're gonna go out and sit on the side of the river and look at the beaver and drink beer. Well, we get there, the beaver dam is busted up a little bit. Uh, I think it was in July when we were down there. And uh, the beaver dam wasn't holding any, any water. It had been breached, but there were tracks everywhere and scat everywhere all through the mud. So super exciting to see that. I'm, I'm thinking I am the first uh, white man, white person to see a beaver dam on the Santa Cruz River since sometime in the 1700s, late 1700s, early 1800s. Speaking so, of, <laughs> we, uh, we got a question from Jen. Uh, do we know anything about the relationship of native populations uh, with the beaver? Yes, and I talk about that when I talk about what's next in our basin here. So I, I will just mention, you know, native populations of other wildlife, Jen, is that what you mean? Let me look at the chat. Oh, I can't while I'm on the... On I, think the it, I think it might be native people, uh, but it just, does, it just says native oh. populations. So that's the other thing. Uh, you know, we're working with the Santa Vera dis District of the Tohono O'odham Nation. They are, the Santa Vera District are the, the WAC people. 
They are the river people walk means water in the Tohono O'odham language. And they are the river pe people. And they don't have any tribal institutional memory stories and such of beavers. So that's another interesting thing that they may have been really far, few and far between on the Santa Cruz River. Uh, it is much wetter in this stretch going south than it probably ever was going north. Uh, you know, who knows what it looked like in 1750, but uh, that is my impression from being on the ground out here with these folks. Uh, and of course, the, the towns, the, the Hittiterians in these two towns had never seen beaver before. They knew what beavers were. They're all, they're all schooled. They knew what beavers were and they were surprised to see it. And they knew about what was going on in the San Pedro because there's a bunch of ajitos over here. And uh, most likely beavers have gone south and crossed the border. I will mention, I put the link, tomorrow's the last day to public comment to Customs Border Protection on the border wall in Santa Cruz and Cochise County. I put the link in the chat. Please, everybody go on, take five minutes and tell them it's a really bad idea, especially trying to put fencing up across the San Pedro and the Santa Cruz rivers. It's just a really dumb idea. Uh, so uh, recently, uh, I've been, I've been talking, I shared this data with Marsha Radke and she put together some some uh, presentations and I think a short paper on the spread of beavers that were introduced on the San Pedro. Uh, they have gone up the Babacomari River. There are now beavers on the Babacomari or there were. They haven't been checked recently. It's a private ranch, uh, but I'm, it's great habitat. I worked on that ranch for many years uh, doing riparian restoration. It's got great beaver habitat. So, uh, the Balacomari is part of the Cienega Creek frog shed. And we call these frog sheds because where Cienega Creek heads north into Tucson, uh, Sonoida Creek heads west towards uh, just north of Nogales, and the Balacomari runs east towards uh, Huachuca City. It's, it's a big giant grassland and very low. And we know frogs can jump across dry land from watershed to watershed. So we think that that's also potential for beavers now that we know beavers are walking across watersheds because they walked across Campini Mesa. Uh, so just very exciting. Uh, what is my time here? We're at 7.03. Okay, so I got a little bit more time. Uh, so I don't know, so Game and Fish, of course, has wildlife management authority in the state of Arizona. In most states, it's a, it's a state. States have wildlife authority. Fish and Wildlife Service deals with endangered and listed species, which the beavers, of course, are not. However, the beavers do provide a lot of habitat when they're in an area for endangered species. Southwestern willow flycatcher, yellow-billed cuckoo, Mexican garter snake, all, all of our endangered fish. There's like seven endangered desert fishes out there. Uh, Chiricahua leopard frogs. Oh, and Mike, there are Chiricahua leopard frogs along the San Pedro in a constructed frog pond that has bullfrog fencing around. And I think it's somewhere near the St. David Cienega. Uh, but I, have, I, I was there when they were planning it, but I have not been back since they implemented that. So just a whole host of, uh, of uh, wildlife that is supported by that retention, by that slowing and sinking of stormwater flows into our near surface aquifers that then can, can continue to contribute water to base flow of these rivers. So it's super important. And I will mention that W Watershed Management Group has a grant right now from Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. And we are working with a bunch of hitos along the San Pedro River to fence the river off, 
uh, put in alternative uh, drinking sources for the cows and then do erosion control with these ranchers because there's a uh, E. coli uh, uh, problem as the river crosses into the U.S. I mean, this, this is all ranch land too, so they're contributing also, but there's a lot of cows down here on the San Pedro River. And then of course you have the mines at the very top of the, which I don't show on this picture. Uh, I'm gonna stop that share because I think that's about all I wanted to talk about. Well, I guess the other thing is, so when these river systems flood, they're flowing from the very top of their watersheds throughout the entire system. And here it comes, crosses back into the US about 10 miles east of Nogales, and then comes over and, and kind of gets on its familiar course along I-19 in the Rio Rico area. This is a continuous flow of water from the headwaters where there are beavers all the way into the Tucson Basin. So there could be a chance of a beaver being flushed down the system. Of course, when he gets to Tucson, we're gonna to have to rescue him and take him back to where he belongs. We won't know where that is, but we'll have a pretty good idea of the San Rafael Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it's the same with the, with the, the uh, San Pedro. When it's flooding, when it's the monsoons, it's flowing from the top of the Huachucas all the way down around and continuously all the way up to points north of I-10. Yeah. So no reason we couldn't have a naturally uh, delivered cadre of beavers into the into the Santa Cruz River watershed. Right now, we don't have the high habitat in in Tucson to support that. Uh, probably the two most uh, or three most uh, perennial systems we have: Sabino. Uh, could probably have a, one family pair. I don't know. I don't think the neighbors up there that spent five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars on their house would like beavers mm -hmm. in this in the Sabido. And same on, on the upper Tank of Verde. There's a spot that's perennial about nine months out of the year, uh, and then Sienega Creek. Speaking of Sienega Creek, um, there we go. Uh, can you give us Trevor an update on the introduction of Beavers, possibly, and the, the EA, I forget what that stands for at the moment. Um. So, about 10, well, a little less than 10 years ago, it may have been seven years ago, and I should have fact-checked myself on all this stuff and had all my notes written out. I've been up on Sutherland Wash all week. We're installing a, a ton of erosion control structures on Sutherland Creek above Catalina State Park the entire week with our with our uh, socially distancing rock crews who are actually our co-op folks who can't do residential co-ops right now so they're out helping me do restoration in a beautiful beautiful spot but I just didn't have time to to get all my citations down but about seven years ago or ten years ago Arizona Game and Fish did a habitat suitability model for Sienega Creek and they determined that there could be up to seven family pairs introduced on Sienega Creek, but they recommended that no more than three. I think it's five or could, it could support five, but they recommended no more than three to see what happens. Uh, we've led, uh, I've, I've taken uh, staff out to this site and then we've led one creek walk out to this site to take a look at the area uh, where the beavers will be uh, introduced and it's just north if you know Sienega Creek it's probably three four miles north of the Empire Ranch headquarters uh, and you get in there and it looks like beaver habitat and once beaver are in there it's going to be a it's going to change that it is going to lengthen the amount of flowing water that they have on Sienega Creek by many miles and it's, so it's pretty exciting. So, so uh, it took a little while for the BLM. Uh, as Mike mentioned, they're understaffed, underfunded. They're fighting political issues at the same time, trying to be good stewards of the land. Uh, we're lucky here in Tucson that we have a pretty strong conservation ethic with our 
with our uh, land managers, the Forest Service and the BLM. It's not true all over the Western United States. Uh, but here we have good people on the ground. And again, uh, it's the stuff that happens at the state level and the national level that really drags down the good work that these people want to do. Anyway, so it took this long, uh, seven, eight years to get a EA going. And an EA is an environmental assessment Excuse me. <coughs> it's what a, uh, anytime there's a federal nexus in a land project, whether the money comes from the federal government or it's a federal agency, uh, you have to follow the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, and you have to determine impacts to the human environment. And the human environment is everything. So they're looking at economics, ecology, cultural uh, history, and everything. And they're doing analysis on what the impacts of this proposed action will be. So uh, that is now passed out of the hands of the biologist and the NEPA specialist and gone to the bosses. Uh, they were hoping that they would publish that for public comment in March or April, and then everything got derailed. And of course, the government will take any excuse to push a deadline. And so the coronavirus was a perfect excuse. So, but we do expect, again, I, I mentioned we have good people in the local office. I think they will get it out here in the near future. You'll definitely hear from Watershed Management Group about how to comment, giving you talking points, and why we support that. Uh, so, I'm way ahead of myself here. So, so for just so for folks who, who don't know about Cienega Creek, I encourage you all to get out there. Get down to Las Cienegas National Conservation Area. That's the area down in the Sonoida Valley between I-10 or the Empire Mountains and the town of Sonoida. Also includes part of the Audubon Research Ranch, which is down south of Sonoida, south of Elgin in the grasslands down there near the Babacomer uh, River. Uh, the, uh, the Las Cienegas National Conservation Area was originally all private land, ranch lands, was bought by developers in the 70s, I think it was, and they were gonna do a satellite city for Tucson down in the Sonoida Valley. Well, that, thank goodness, never came to fruition. But then Animax Map Mining stepped in and had bought all the private lands for its water rights for Sienega Creek because they wanted to pump water up to Rosemont Junction to start mining that mining uh, bot or that copper body that is now being proposed for the uh, Hud Bay uh, mine, Rosemont Copper Mine. Anyway, so. Uh, locals here in in the area and uh jim colby uh, our senator at the time he may have been a congressman senator uh convinced the blm through some land exchanges uh to acquire that ranch land and then it was designated as a national conservation area and the bureau of land management the blm manages vast swaths of western landscapes and a lot of it is managed for cattle and oil and gas uh, but it all has natural value but they they in the 2000s they elevated a bunch of lands to a national conservation area status and developed a national conservation land system to elevate some of their most precious lands kind of above that multiple use mandate where they have to allow mining, they have to allow grazing, they have to allow gas and oil extraction. So uh, along with the San Pedro River is, is also a riparian national conservation area. So they, they are the two crown jewels of the BLMs in southeastern Arizona. Uh, and so it starts in the kind of in the Canelo Hills, flows north right past Sonoida, uh, goes another 10 miles and gets near the Empire Ranch headquarters, 
which is a, a great historic, national historic site with an amazing old ranch house and a great history behind it and well worth visiting, really neat place. But then getting down on, onto the creek is, is, is the most amazing thing out there. And uh, it then flows another 10 miles or so until it goes through a, a, the gap that narrows in the Empire Mountains and starts flowing down towards I-10, crosses under I-10, and enters the Sienega Creek Natural Preserve, which was purchased in the 1980s. Julia, I'm sorry, I forgot what date that was. Uh, but is uh, it's about seven miles of the creek that's protected. You have to have a permit to go in. There's no motorized vehicles. There's no grazing. Great group of people from uh, Pima County Office of Sustainability, Conservation, Natural Resources, Parks and Rec, and Regional Flood Control District co-manage that area. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful area. I encourage everybody to go out to the Gabe Zimmerman Trailhead easy access down to one of the uh, the wetter spots along Sienega Creek. Uh, however, it doesn't quite look like the beaver reintroduction site down on La Sienega's National Conservation Area. It doesn't have the habitat complexity, the uh, doesn't have everything that, it, that Sienega Creek Natural Preserve does not have all those elements of beaver habitat that would need to be there to, to uh, provide a safe haven for, for uh, beavers. However, Watershed Management Group, along with those Pima County uh, departments I mentioned, are all scheming, writing grants, trying to figure out ways how we can protect the existing flows get more riparian vegetation growing. Uh, a lot of that has to do with tributary drainages, have a lot of erosion issues. So dealing with the erosion, dealing with all the people who have straws in the, and the shallow groundwater aquifer out there, the well owners. No well owner should be using well water that comes from a shallow groundwater area to water landscapes. You should be using rainwater. I don't blame people for wanting to drink well water. It tastes much better than what Tucson water delivers to us, unfortunately. But don't use it on your landscape. Uh, so, and then those issues just persist as the Sienega Creek enters the Tucson Basin and becomes the Pantano Wash. We believe. <laughs> yes. Okay, thanks. Um, I. Am I out of time already? Right. Uh, we've got about. Um, a few minutes left. I think there was one question that was back up in here. Um, but I just wanted to say um, thank you to everyone who, uh, I saw a few people jump off. Um, so thank you all to everyone who um, is on here and thank you for all the, the questions. Um, let me find that question that we had up here. Um, and also, if um, you're interested, you can stay after as well to, to ask any questions that you all may have. Um, we wanted to get, there it is, um, Mike's email prior to um, ending the event as well. Um, so Mike, if you are interested in sharing that, that would be great um, for anyone who is interested in asking questions. Uh, do you know how to get it to him, or you you could just give it to him? Or... If you if you want to say it, I can type it out. Okay, it's uh, I'll spell it. It's S A R J U E S O S at gmail dot com. So that is for everyone who is interested in asking Mike any questions over email, um, and then we have. Um, I thought we had one more question. If I missed it, I apologize. But thank you all for um, coming. Hey, I still have 10 minutes to finish my story. <laughs> question for Michael. There we go. I found it. Um, do we, oh, how do we get involved in the December beaver count? Well, um, we have my email. So uh, please, send, please send me an email and um, we'd, 
be delighted to have you come down. And uh, like I said, I'm 65, so I need some people with uh, better legs and feet than I have. Uh, uh, but it's 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 fun, you know. It's a lot of fun I, when I do it. You know, as uh, Trevor was saying, they, they go out and find bullfrogs and drink beer, and uh, we look for beaver and drink beer. So, um, or you don't have to drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely get something set up, Mike, to bring an organized group, whether that's one of our youth. Uh, organizations we work with or our regular volunteers we have a we have a whole ton of volunteers who love to come out and do this sort of stuff so uh uh we'll oh, that would be fun. Something set up for this winter maybe even this uh late summer maybe we can come down and do a beaver walk yeah uh, the next question that we've got actually is where do you all think are the best places to plan creek walks to see beavers I'm sorry, can I hear that again? So, so, Mike, we have a series of creek walks we've been doing, and we actually did one uh, with Sean, Sean Lowry from Game and Fish, and he took us down to uh, uh, Old Mine there, north of, I forget the name of the town, San Manuel, where there's that off-channel beaver dam in the artisanal well run or artisanal spring run, the Mesquite uh, Dam. And we also took us down to the lower San Pedro wildlife area where we searched unsuccessfully, but we saw the portions of a dam that had been, uh, been uh, washed out. So we were doing these creek walks, so we'd love to plan one with you for uh, early fall, and then uh, come down with a group of people. We get tons of interest from people. Uh, and then we'll get something set up to help you in December with your, uh, with the count. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that would be great. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, you could take a stretch. You could, uh, you know, I, I don't like people to be disappointed. So I'd like to give you a stretch that where you have a, a good possibility of seeing something. Um, and, you know, you can do as much as you want because it's, it's been pretty much just me and that uh, one guy I showed in that slide. So we can, we can use all the help we can get. So How this, long do those, oh, sorry. That, that question came from Catlow Shipek, one of the founders and my boss here, married to the executive director, Lisa. And he just happens to be a trail runner. He could probably run that whole 45 miles in one day and see a whole bunch of beavers. Yeah, I don't know if he'll respond. We'll see. He might. We should have him do that and wear a GoPro. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be fun. Cool. Um, I uh, was wondering how long do those surveys last? You said it was 45 miles. Well, uh, I like to do it as quickly as possible. The reason being that this year when I was doing it, all of a sudden there was a flood in December, you know, and then that washed up the dams. So I, you know, it's normally taken me over a month, like about a month and a half. But uh, if I, you know, had everything go the way I wanted it, I'd try to get several groups to do it and do it all within a couple of weeks so that we had a good snapshot of exactly what was going on at that time. And I did unmute Catlow so he could respond. <laughs> Let's see if he's... He doesn't have to respond. I just like calling him out. <laughs> he asked me to unmute him, so I don't know. It says it's unmuted, but I can't hear anything that they're saying. There you go. Can you hear me now? Can you hear oh, me now? Yep. Yeah, we can yes. hear you. Okay. Yes. Hello. I just wanted to thank Mike for your presentation. I learned a lot, um, a lot that I didn't know about the San Pedro Beavers. It's awesome the amount of work you've been doing um, out there. I mean, really, you have the on the ground knowledge from going out there and doing the surveys yourself for so many years. This was an issue that came up. Um, in the fall when we did our Beavers Brews uh, big event and we just weren't sure what was happening on, on the San Pedro. So um, we'd love to support that message that you're trying to get out there to reintroduce more beavers 
I think that's a really good message and we want to get that message out there. Um, and we'd love to get, yeah, our volunteers out, maybe our Flow 365 monitors who monitor flow here in Tucson would like to come down for a field trip. There are some on at this event, so maybe, yep. maybe they'd be interested. Sean, <laughs> yes, Sean, thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that, thank you, thank you. And I'll just mention, again, Mike, thanks, that was fantastic. I learned a whole lot. I'm a herpetologist by training, but I love beavers because they help frogs and garter snakes <laughs> and, and mud turtles. Uh, we are planning s some more beaver events in the fall, so I'll be talking to you in the future, but just to let folks know, we probably will be having a, uh, a, a live beavers happy hour. Maybe we can all get together instead of doing this by Zoom uh, sometime in the fall. And then we, uh, that's like a Thursday night. And then I think we'll be screening the Beaver Believers movie again at the loft also on maybe on a Sunday afternoon or something. So everybody stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. That was fantastic, Mike. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat as well. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you are welcome to post them. Um, but otherwise, thank you all for, for being here. Nice. Thanks. I have a question. Um, yes. Mike, I don't know how much you've been involved in any grant work um, with beavers, but there's a um, NIFWIF Native Fish grant, and I've seen that they funded beaver work in the past. Just wondering about that as an option. Um, and does, um, can you tell a little bit more about what Friends of San Pedro is doing related to beavers? Like what, are you doing conservation work uh, through that organization? Well, I'm afraid I don't have a very good answer for you. I, I, um, I kind of do my own thing. I don't go to meetings, I'm not on the board. Um, I just spend a lot of time on the river, so I try to do constructive things when I'm down there. I, I've done the videos, and we did get some grant money to do videos. Uh, we did several, as I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Those were all paid for with various uh, grant sources. Um, as far as what the Friends of the San Pedro do, they're mostly doing uh, bird walks, things like that. They have their bookstore. Um, I, I don't feel like I can adequately represent them. Um, but as far as having people come down and uh, do surveys and helping out, I'm certainly uh, happy about that. And, it, you know, it's good for us to have this information. And uh, I need to do a better job of keeping track of it all. And uh, at this time when Marcia isn't, um, doesn't feel like she can really um, participate in these events because of what's happening at the BLM, it's good for us to have that information so that we know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is this grant money you're talking about? What would that be to? to um, well, I just I was looking at it today, but um, NIFWIF has a native fish. I forget actually, exactly what's it's called. It's called Bring Back the Natives, and it's for any native aquatic species. I that was par partial funding for our bullfrog work when we came across those beavers in the San San uh, San Rafael Valley. So I'm gonna take a look at that, Lisa. And if I think there's any potential that maybe we could support Mike and his work and, you know, just cause it's gonna be so important that we are ready to communicate this wonderful beaver story with the citizens of Tucson when this environmental assessment comes out for public comment. So I'll take a look at that tomorrow and uh, maybe we can get something going with Mike here. Well, it'd be interesting, yeah. Uh, I can get you in touch with uh, Robert Weisler, who's our president, and he would know more about um, organizing things. As far as what I'm able to do, I'm certainly uh, able and willing to do a video work on a subject for educational purposes. And um, I like going out to the river. If there are surveys that can be done, you know, I can participate in those. Um, cool. Yeah, thank you again so much. Uh, this was great. Learned a lot. Mm -hmm.